All right, we're going to take it back to the ancient times now. This next researcher works on fossilized mastodons. See, mm. this next speaker is like straight out of Jurassic Park. She collects woolly mammoth parts and she grinds their bones to make her bread because she's looking for those ancient DNA threads. Oh, not to clone a mammoth. No one panic. She's trying to figure out all the reasons why they vanished. I mean, how does the whole population get to zero? This woman is an extinction battling hero. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. Introducing Beth Shapiro. Beth Shapiro, everybody. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. That was... Uh quite interesting. I've never been called a, an extinction hero before. I don't think I've stopped any extinctions from happening. I might have caused some extinctions in my time, but not probably not on purpose. Um, so, uh, who knows what that is? An ant, right? And what is the ant in? In amber. Amber is a kind of sticky tree sap that would have gone on top of that ant and stuck it there. And that particular ant has been stuck in that bit of tree sap, that bit of amber, for about 70 million years. Looks pretty good though, doesn't it? Just like it could have been yesterday. So how many of you saw or read or know about the Jurassic Park movies? Pretty many, right? A few applause. <laughs> I don't know if I would give them applause, but whatever. Remember what the scientists did with the insects in amber in those movies? They stuck that needle in there and drew out some DNA, the building blocks of life. They weren't interested in the ant DNA, though, or the mosquito DNA, or whatever it was. They were interested in the DNA from whatever it was that thing had been eating, right? And what had it been eating? Dinosaurs! So they used that dinosaur DNA, and they built themselves a bunch of new dinosaurs, and they tried to contain them on that island where they had Jurassic Park. And the whole thing, of course, went terribly, horribly wrong, and blah, blah, blah. Three movies later, we're still waiting for more. <laughs> Thank goodness that is just stuff of fiction, right? Well, turns out my whole scientific field is pretty much based on that movie. So where does a real-life DNA scientist go to get their ancient DNA? For me, the answer is up north, to the Arctic, where it's cold and dry, which is perfect for the long-term preservation of DNA molecules. This particular Arctic is in Canada, near a town called Dawson City in the Yukon Territory. And what you see here is some gold miners that are washing away this frozen dirt. It's frozen a bit there. They're washing away this frozen dirt, trying to get to the gold-bearing gravels underneath. They're interested in just getting rid of all that frozen dirt. It's called permafrost, actually. Now, I don't really care about the gold, much to their surprise, or about the gravels, but it's in that frozen dirt where I can find my ancient DNA. So we go. Here's an example of something that we found up there last year. You can see is one, two, three, Four pieces of mammoth bone here. This is part of a vertebra, so you can see how big this is. That's the and backbone. The neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole is broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. That water is actually pretty gross. It's, uh, it's melting permafrost, and so it's all that decaying organic material. That particular mammoth is about 30,000 years old. Um, it's meaning it lived just before the coldest part of the last ice age, and that water contains all sorts of rotting stuff that's pretty much been rotting for the last 30,000 years. So you can imagine that it doesn't smell very nice, and you don't really want to get under it. Um, 
So about that time, mammoths actually lived across the whole northern hemisphere. So I get to go to lots of cool places to try to find these guys. Here's a picture of me a few summers ago with a colleague in Siberia, where on the bottom end of the, of the Timur Peninsula, sort of in north central Siberia, and if you look behind me, you see what a typical high Arctic landscape looks like today. There's no trees, there's no people, there are very few animals, unless you count the many millions of mosquitoes. I think if you look closely, you can actually see the mosquitoes around my legs and around the black part of the wheel there. They can pretty much pick you up and take you away up in the Arctic. But this is not what this looked like 10,000, 100,000, even a million years ago. And that's where I want to go, back in time. I guess you could kind of call me a time-traveling scientist. And in that case, I guess that kind of scary-looking Russian helicopters, my time machine of sorts. But this is actually what this would have looked like during the Ice Ages. And you recognize the woolly mammoths here. They look like elephants with longer um, uh, ivory pieces here. And you'll also see some lions down here in the bottom. There were lions in across the Northern Hemisphere, much like there are in Africa today. You see the back end of some horses over there, and there were lots of things, woolly rhinoceros, um, giant camels, all kinds of crazy, interesting animals. Now, most of these are gone today. We have a few left. In the Arctic, you can still find brown bears and muskots and some reindeer, which is the same thing as caribou. Um, but what I want to know is why these guys have survived when things like the mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros went extinct. Was it because the mammoth and the woolly rhino just weren't really able to adapt as the climate began to change at the end of the Ice Age, as today's warm interglacial period began? Or was it because humans turned up in the environment and just killed off everything that was really big and looked a little bit tasty? Fortunately for us, these really cold, dry environments of the Arctic mean that these bones of all these different animals are preserved incredibly well. And probably even more fortunately, the DNA that's inside the cells that make up these bones is also very well preserved. And we can use those DNA sequences to learn when, where, why, and how these different animals went extinct. So we go up into the Arctic, and we bring them back to the lab, and we grind a bit up and extract DNA. I've brought some here, actually, that we can uh, have a look at, if you fancy it. Um, let's see. Actually, you know what? This will be more fun if you guys do this. Can I have three volunteers to come up and look? I got one here. There was one here. If you could come over here and come up these steps, please. OK, you stand in and wave in your arm right there. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I've got three boxes here, so each of you can choose a box. Come on up, choose a box, right? Let's see. All right, so which, which box do you want? Do you want to just come and try to... Wait, wait, oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, there's a rule, right? You can't actually touch these things with your bare hands, so you're going to have to get dressed up like ancient DNA scientists in order to do this, okay? Can you do that? All right, so uh, here you go, here you go, have a bag, here, well, I've got one for you as well, here we go, here you go, okay, good, good, all right, so what, what's, you, what's your name? Me, yes. Kayla. Kayla, Kayla, um, do you know how to put on an ancient DNA suit? No, I didn't think so. I've brought a picture here of people in my lab who are wearing their ancient DNA suit, so that you have a better idea of what you're going to look like once you're actually dressed up. So um, let's, let's see how speedily we can do this. What do you think? What's your name? Jacob. Jacob? Mm -hmm. And your name? Julian. Julian? All right, so we're going to have a race between Jacob and Julian and Kayla. Yes? Who thinks Jacob's going to win? That seems like some pretty good support. What about... What about you? Who thinks Julian's going to win? More support. And who's going for the woman? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, come on, guys. Get to it. Get the suit on. So the reason that uh, these guys have to wear a suit in order to touch <laughs> these bones... <clears throat> <laughs> It's a suit, you gotta step in it. See, those are the legs there, yeah? I think we got, uh -huh. 
<laughs> the reason they have to wear a suit in order to do this is because they're still alive, which means their DNA <laughs> is in really tip-top condition. In fact, if they touched anybody on the way out to try to get up here, they left their DNA all over you and you're leaving your DNA all over your chairs. And when you think about it, it actually gets kind of gross after a while, doesn't it? Um, but if they were to touch these bones, the, the DNA that's in these bones is all old and broken down. <laughs> Excuse me, that's a shoe cover. <laughs> Face mask, see? <laughs> Good job. Let's see what else we got in here. Shoe covers and face masks. You're doing a good job here. You need some help with the arms? Excellent, excellent. Anyway, if they were to touch this and leave their own DNA on the bones themselves, then it would be very hard for us to be able to fish out that old broken down bits of DNA um, from their really good quality alive DNA. You guys nearly ready here? Yeah. Yep, you're doing well. So anybody who works in my lab, as you see here, has to get dressed up like proper ancient DNA scientists before they can, uh, before they can do any work in the lab. I think we're going to have a winner over here. Well, I don't know. We got this, just the shoe covers going on here. You're doing a good job. I think it must be that. Oh, don't worry about it. Your feet are all covered up as it is, I think. <laughs> yeah. Just making sure you get those gloves on so we can actually touch these bones. And if anybody, I have three gloves. good, because there's only one here. <laughs> Excellent. So if anybody who doesn't get a chance to see these bones wants to look at them, we are going to be in the lobby after we're finished with the show so that everybody can see them. Which way does it go? That part goes over your nose, and then it goes, right, like this goes around your head. <laughs> there you go. So very good. You were first. All right. Excellent. So we have a winner. You guys are doing well. Don't worry about the shoe covers for now. I think, I think we've, uh, you're probably not going to touch this. Do you, okay. So would you like to go first? Yeah. All right. So do you want to reach in there and see, what's, see what you got? Okay. All right. So pull that out. Hold it up so everybody can see. Do you have any idea what that is? What kind of a bone? A woolly mammoth bone? It's not a woolly mammoth bone. A woolly mammoth bone would be really, really big. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. That's actually a horse bone, yeah? And you can see right there, there's a cut in it where we've taken a piece of the bone to extract its DNA and to figure out how old it is. And that horse bone is about 48,000 years old. That's pretty old, yeah. Pretty cool, huh? All right, are you ready to take yours out? All right. Go for it. You want to turn around and hold that up? Know what that is? It's part of a tusk from a woolly mammoth. Yeah, so that's a piece of very old ivory. Pretty cool, huh? All right, last one, are you ready? This is a special one. Hmm, look at that. What do you think that is? It's poo. <laughs> it's 8,000-year-old poo from a reindeer. <laughs> it turns out you can get lots of DNA from poo, not only from the animal who pooed the poo, but from the stuff that that animal was eating. So it's actually really useful to learn about environments in the past. All right, thank you guys if you want to put your stuff back in the boxes so we can show them later. And you can keep your ancient DNA suits so you can go back and take them down, take them off when you get back to your seat. Take your bag so you can put your suit in your bag. <laughs> I actually chose these three. We find lots of different things up in the Arctic, but I chose these three because they're kind of special. It turns out that if you guys turned around and left this room and went outside, and it accidentally happened to be 20,000 years ago, you might run into any one of these different animals that are here 
in these jars. So it isn't just in the high Arctic that these amazing creatures were found, but also here, right there in New York City. And in fact, you might run into, and this is one of my favorite extinct animals, this guy right here. He's called Arctodus simus, the giant, hyper-carnivorous, short-faced bear. If he stood up like this, he would stand up to be about three times as big as me. So that's a pretty big bear, not the kind of guy you'd want to run into in a back alley, really. Although he might like running into you, because I bet you'd look like a tasty morsel, yes? <laughs> Also, we could think about things like camels. When you think about camels, you generally think of old world deserts. But some people think there were maybe four or five different species of camel that lived in North America during the Pleistocene. And let's not forget the cats. There were lots of species of big cats that lived here. This is Panthera leo atrox, a close relative of the lion that lives in Africa. But there were also dirt tooth cats and scimitar tooth cats and saber tooth cats. Whoever it was that was naming the cats apparently had a thing for knives. Um, very unusual. So when we go out into the field, after a typical day of collection, like we do in the gold mining community in Alaska, we'll end up with bones like this, about this many. Um, most of these are going to be mammoth and bison and reindeer, because those are the animals that were most abundant at the time. But after many years of collecting, we have a pretty big data set of all the different animals that lived during the Ice Ages. And the DNA we get from those bones tells a really fascinating story. It's a story about survival and extinction, about rich grasslands and bloodthirsty predators. It's a story about how the ability to adapt to a rapidly changing environment can mean the difference between life and death. Now today, our environment is again changing, and it's changing pretty quickly. It's really difficult to predict the future, so it's hard to make these important decisions about what species or what habitats we should conserve or protect, given that we don't have a lot of money floating around these days. But using the DNA sequences that we can extract from these old bones, we can actually watch these extinct populations or the populations that survived as they go through periods of really rapid climate change that already happened. We can learn from the past and use this information to protect the future. And all I have to do is go out into some pretty incredible, almost untouched environments and paddle around a canoe, picking up old, big, dead things. There's a mammoth bone right there. That's a mammoth femur. This bone on the top right there. So there you go. We're not going to make any dinosaurs, and we're probably not going to have Jurassic Park. We're definitely not going to have Jurassic Park. But what about an Ice Age Park? We can't do it yet, but I won't say never. And until then, I'm just going to be up in the Arctic hunting for mammoths. And I think my job is pretty cool. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.